Hi, I'm Mike with SimSystem, and today we're going to show you how to import and process full contour restorations within Millbox. For today's example, we're going to be using the Millbox Standard Edition with a demo machine. So we're going to start by going to our first step, which is to start with a new job. And when we click on this step, we're going to be greeted with a visualization of different machines that we have available. Uh, in my case, I only have the one demo machine. But if I did have multiple machines, they would show up right here in this top list. Uh, I do additionally have this little uh, icon here, which is the tool set icon or the tool package. And what this allows me to do is switch between different tool manufacturers or tool geometries. Uh, for example, I might have a specific manufacturer of, of tools that I use on a daily basis, but for large, tall anterior cases, I may need to switch to a different tool manufacturer that has tools with longer reach. Um, this is one of the uh, flexibilities afforded within this tool, and it's going to be dependent upon how your reseller has configured your version. So make sure to consult with them on which tool package you need to be using. So for this example, I'm going to start with Zirconia. And we have two different types of fixtures available to us. Uh, in this case, it's either the disc type or the pin block type. And this is going to vary going from one material to the next. As you can see, PMMA, wax, those both use disc only. Uh, for titanium, I have the option of a disc fixture or a pre-milled abutment fixture. So again, it just depends on your machine and how that's been set up. In this case, again, I'm going to use Zirconia. So we're going to select that and select our disc fixture and hit the check mark button to continue. Once I've done that, the cam is automatically taking me to the next step of the process, which is to import my object. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and import some crowns that we're going to use for today. Uh, in this case, I have two posterior crowns that have been output from 3Shape. And uh, we're specifically talking about 3Shape in this video today because we've actually done an integration that we want to kind of show you uh, how this looks. So the integration that we've done specifically with 3Shape to date has been to import the interproximal and occlusal contacts directly from the CAD system, uh, which is really helpful when we're in going through the nesting process. So not only can we avoid placement of support pins on those interproximals, but we can actually do it in an automatic fashion now. So here we see what my minimum thickness required is. Based on these two restorations that I've imported, I need at least a 10 millimeter disc. Uh, just so happens I have three partially used discs, so I can select that number three and uh, go in here and simply select the disc that I feel most appropriate for this case. Now, if I didn't want to do this, I could simply create a new disc, or maybe I don't have any 10 mils left, I could go and create a 12 millimeter disc instead. So it just kind of depends on what you have available to yourself. Uh, for this example, again, I'm going to go back to my used discs and use one of my partially used materials. So in this case, it also uh, sorts these discs by percentage used. So you can see that the top one, we've used about 15% of that blank. And so it kind of just shows it at the top of the list to give us, allow us to use those more used or partially used discs up first. So I'm going to hit the check mark and it's automatically going to take me to the next step. Now it did nest and place these files just as it gave me the preview of how it was going to do so. Uh, but if I wanted to go ahead and move these or make any adjustments before I send this to the mill, now is kind of my stage or uh, area that I can go ahead and do that. So if I want to click and drag and move these parts around, uh, you can click and drag and drop them uh, like so. Uh, and you can see uh, that the interproximal curves that are, that are being displayed here, these purple lines, uh, that's kind of giving me a, a go slash a no-go area for my support pins. Uh, and uh, for example, if I was to place a support pin on that line, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to flash yellow to indicate that there's a problem with the placement of this support pin. So if I want to move that, I just simply click on the support pin and drag and drop it where I want it to be. Uh, also, for some reason, if uh, you know, depending on the angle um, of the part and how the support pins are being drawn, you can also come in here and drag the support pins at the stock side to kind of change the angular engagement with the material. Uh, give yourself a little bit more flexibility there as needed. Now we can see here on the parts that I do have some blue uh, rendered areas. And what these blue rendered areas are signifying is uh, essentially that um, these are undercut areas that have been designed on the part, either intentionally or unintentionally. But uh, we can also see that rendered based off of my placement of my support pin. So if I put the support pin too far above that um, 
equator line, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to create undercuts because that tool can't physically see this from the 180 or from the bottom side. So I'm just going to make sure my pin placement is correct here. And once I've done that, uh, if I wanted to save maybe a little bit more space in here, one of the things that I can do is just kind of uh, rotate and get these part borders intersecting. Uh, so that way I'm, I'm basically saving up some space there on the disc. Uh, now, depending on where my undercuts are, as you can see on this case, I have a lot of undercuts on just really this one side of the crown. There's a little bit here on the uh, lingual side, but in this case, what I can actually do, uh, if I want those undercuts to mill out, I can kind of rearrange my part a little bit here. And uh, what I've done is I've faced the undercuts with the open face of the adjacent crown. And what this is going to do is give my tool a little bit more clearance to get in there and mill those areas out uh, without me having to increase my part border because right now I'm at 3.3 millimeters and that's basically the distance between the outer edge of the crown and the part border or the material going around that crown. So if I wanted to create extra clearance for the tool I could simply come in here and raise this value up to maybe four millimeters or even five millimeters depending on how severe my undercuts are. But in this case, um, you know, kind of simply facing it uh, next to the other part border and getting the getting the area aligned with this has given me so much more clearance to come in with the tool from this angle as needed. And we don't really need to open up the part border over here. Uh, for my 180 side, I'm pretty sure and confident that the tool can get to these little undercuts down below without me increasing my part border. So uh, from a nesting perspective, that's most of what I have to pay attention to. Now there is one thing that's very important on crown and bridge and this is applicable for a single unit like I'm showing you in today's example uh, but it can also be applicable for a large uh, large scale bridge. So one thing we want to make sure of and um, in the 2018 and previous versions this margin line is not displayed in pink. Uh, so the reason we're seeing this is because I'm running on a 2019 version. Um, but the, the curve is kind of highlighted in pink here to indicate to me that it is the prep line margin or the prep line curve. Um, and basically what I want to verify is that this actually follows the margin through and through. Now in this particular example, uh, one of the benefits of having the additional CAD data from 3Shape or we also accept the CAD data from ExoCAD is uh, having the additional margin line data from the CAD software allows us to mark the margins exactly as they were designed in the actual case. So the biggest benefit there is that we're going to get a very nice cleanly milled accurate margin because when we go to traverse during the milling operations we're actually following this curve as it goes around the restoration. So it's very important that that line matches up. Um, what do we do in the event that that line doesn't match up or the event that we need to recreate uh, or manually designate our margins? Well we do have some tools for that. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go in and first of all I'm going to go in and delete those curves um, just to kind of get rid of them and we'll kind of simulate um, we'll simulate the uh, the situation of the margins not having been detected during the import process. So we'll kind of see the crown like this. And it's very important to know that we need to fix this uh, or that this is an issue, uh, particularly because if we don't fix this issue, what's going to happen is we may end up with, a, with an internal prep area that's not finished out, or maybe it's finished out, but there's some undercuts because we didn't mill it out from the proper insertion direction. So what, what do we do if we don't have that data? Well, we can go here to margin line detection, and this tool works a little bit better than what's automatically detected during import, so it takes its time a little bit more. Um, but we're just going to click close to the margin, and we're going to set what the thickness of the margin was that we designed. In this case, I'm going to leave it default at 0.15 millimeters. And it's going to automatically try to detect where that margin is and designate it around the crown. Now you can see that it's close. It's very close to what we actually designed. It's not quite exactly there, but uh, this is going to be close enough to allow for us to properly mill this part. Now for some reason or another, if this line did jut off or kind of break off uh, course, what we would want to do is we'd want to make sure that we go in and manually draw our margin lines. Now this is kind of a last resort if for some reason your automatic detection is not working and even the automatic tool here is not working, we can go in and manually draw these margin lines. Um, so let me, let me delete this one out first. 
and then we're going to go in and manually mark or draw our, or draw our, our margin lines. So what you do with this is you just simply start by clicking on the margin itself and it's going to be as detailed as you're clicking here. So uh, I'll just I'll kind of breeze over that area so that way we can see how it looks like when we're when we're trying to be accurate versus uh, when we're not. And this process again is more tedious because it is a manual designation. Um, but in some cases where you have a really bad prep or really jagged prep that um, could be due to either a bad scan or not so ideal scan uh, or just not a good design, you can kind of come in here and manually designate this along the margin. And then once you get close to where you started, uh, you will have an option to kind of click here to close that curve. And again, we're going to set the thickness. In this case, I'm going to do 0.15. Now in my particular example, again, you can kind of see that uh, I was less detailed in my designation over here. So this is not going to give me an accurate, uh, a very accurate representation of where the margin was. And the machining result is that we could have some tool paths that go straight uh, along this curve rather than follows the actual margins and that could lead to potential chipping. So that would be definitely something that we would want to fix. Uh, and even if there is a curve presently designated there and I want to just come in and auto detect it, um, I can do that and it will automatically get rid of the original set of curves and replace it with the newly detected ones. So we can see here it's not exactly uh, on the margin like this particular part on the left is, but we can see that it's very close and in this particular case it's close enough to what I'm trying to accomplish. So for crown and bridge, those are the main items that we're looking for, just ensuring that our support pins are properly placed. Uh, one thing I can't stress enough is that I see a lot of people grab support pins and just kind of move them from the top view. And the only problem with doing it this way is I can't really tell where I'm placing my support pin relative to this equator line. So I always advise people, if you've got a 3D mouse, use the 3D mouse uh, or just use your right click on your mouse to rotate and come in from a side view. So that way when you're placing your support pins, you don't only see positionally around the part where you're placing it, but you also see in terms of the equator line where you're placing your support pin. And that's gonna help, um, uh, that's gonna help alleviate any potential uh, issues where you're placing that, that support way too high or way too far below that, uh, that curve causing an additional undercut to need to be milled out. So once you've gotten everything nested properly and you've got your cases uh, positioned within the disk, at this point we're already on the start mill stage. So we're going to select save toolpath. And what this is going to do is pop up a, uh, a list of options for this particular job. Now in this particular case, uh, I can choose to do undercuts in 3 plus 2 for the external portion. And again, this is talking about the external areas. Uh, or I can do it in a 5-axis simultaneous or 5-axis continuous toolpath. Uh, in this particular example, I'm going to go with just the uh, external undercuts 5-axis simultaneous. It'll take a little bit longer to calculate, but less time to run on the machine. And uh, in this particular example, I do have some, uh, some detailed anatomy on these cases. So I'm going to use the 0.6 millimeter to come in and define that secondary anatomy. Now I have the option for the 0.3, but these cases I don't believe were designed using a very detailed library. So I don't think it's warranted to use it in this particular example. But once I made my selections, I'm just going to select the check mark to continue. And basically what I've just done is I've selected the characteristics for how I want this job to be milled out. So, uh, and, and you can change that from one run to the next. So these options are dynamic. Now, let's say that you're always gonna use 0.6 or 0.3 millimeter on anatomy for these parts. Well, you do have the option to go in there in your options with your reseller and they can designate those as default options or they can change what default options are available um, or visible even to select. And so the last table that kind of pops up here is our tool table reminder which kind of lets us know what tools need to go in each slot, uh, slot number on the left and the tool information on the right. And uh, one of the cool new features about the 2019 version is that uh, even though I haven't clicked OK to confirm out of the tools table, you can see in the background that it is processing and it is calculating the file. So um, that, is, uh, uh, that is a nice uh, background batching feature of the CAM software.
So this concludes the workflow process for Crown and Bridge. And if you guys would like to see more videos, please be sure to link up and subscribe to us on YouTube and join our Millbox Experts group on Facebook to share, collaborate, ask questions, anything that you guys can think of Millbox related. Thanks for watching.